Our next speaker is Dr. Gary Solomon. He is a clinical neuropsychologist at the Vanderbilt University School of Medicine, co-director of the Vanderbilt Sports Concussion Center. For the past 20 years, he served as the team neuropsychologist for the Nashville Predators and the consulting neuropsychologist for the Tennessee Titans. He is a consulting neuropsychologist for the athletic department at Vanderbilt, Tennessee Tech, and the University of Tennessee. Dr. Solomon is the senior medical advisor to the National Football League's Health and Safety Department. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gary Solomon. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I uh, appreciate Steve's uh, invitation. It's hard to follow Dr. Bales and uh, Dr. Bazarian, but I'll, I'll see what I can do. Um, I'm going to take a deeper dive today into uh, CTE. Um, my disclosures, Steve pretty much rattled off all of them. Uh, all the stuff about Vanderbilt and the Titans and the Predators and all that's going to go away in about uh, 25 days to be exact as I retire from Vanderbilt. Uh, I got my Medicare card in the mail about two years ago. <laughs> And I'm convinced that's the government's way of telling you that it's the fourth quarter. So uh, with the disclosures done, I have four objectives today. One, let's talk about what we knew about CTE in the 20th century, which has now been termed classical CTE. We'll then talk about modern CTE, what we're told we know about modern CTE. We'll review what consensus groups tell us about CTE, and then we'll talk a little bit about what we need to know about CTE. I want to take you from the 20th century into the 21st and how this concept of CTE has evolved. And this idea of classical versus modern CTE was really posited by Andrew Gardner, uh, Grant Iverson, and Paul McCrory. Okay, let's talk about classical CTE. In the beginning, as, as Dr. Bales uh, explained to you, uh, Teddy Roosevelt convened uh, what became the NC2A early in the uh, 20th century. What prompted that, in addition to the number of spinal cord injuries and cerebral injuries in collegiate athletes, there was a paper written uh, by Nichols and Smith, who were Harvard's uh, sports medicine doctors. They published it in the uh, Boston Medical and Surgical Journal, which is now the New England Journal of Medicine. And, and their concern was about concussions and whether there were long-term effects. This prompted a response in JAMA the following week, uh, again, expressing concerns about uh, the effects of concussion. And Emily Harrison wrote a paper uh, several years ago in the American Journal of Public Health and she aptly pointed out that the concern about concussion is nothing new. Uh, people are saying we are in a concussion crisis. Well, this is probably the second concussion crisis, and the first one probably happened at the beginning of the 20th century. In 1926, Osnato and Giliberti, who were neurologists, uh, made a presentation at the uh, neurology conference. It was published the following year. And back then, they raised the question of whether concussion was a transient state, uh, and if, in fact, there were degenerative aspects to it. The next year, Harrison Martland, as Dr. Bales mentioned, uh, published his paper on punch drunk. Uh, that was a great lecture. You can see the arrow pointing to the back of my head. Uh, one of the more memorable ones that uh, I've been to. But the whole notion of this uh, encephalopathy of boxers came out of Martland's 1928 paper. In the 1960s, I started getting interested in uh, concussion. I, I had one playing JV football. Um, but then my dad and I used to watch uh, Gillette Friday night fights. This was black and white TV. It was a weekly thing. And these were some of the boxers that I watched. Uh, Jerry Quarry, Jimmy Ellis, and Jimmy Young. All of them died with early onset dementia. And when you look at the exposure that these uh, boxers endured, the average in their career, 58 heavyweight bouts, 402 rounds. Jerry Quarry, this is a picture of him when he's 47. He died at 53. 
Jerry Quarry turned professional in 1965, in May of 1965, and between May and December, he had 14 professional heavyweight bouts, three in the month of June alone. So when it comes to boxing, I view that as an entirely separate category, in my opinion. Uh, in 1969, this is a, a poorly known study, uh, Roberts, and this is not Roberts, I couldn't find a picture of him, so I just Googled old British boxer. Uh, <laughs> but Roberts was a physician, a sports medicine doc, and he had a, uh, group of over 16,000 retired professional British boxers. He took a stratified uh, age sample, uh, identified 250, and actually examined 224 of them. He found that 17% had some type of encephalopathic syndrome. 11% had a mild form, 6% had a severe form. And he found that those who boxed over 50 professional bouts had a much higher rate of this uh, syndrome. He described the syndrome as typically stable with some age-related worsening. And importantly, there were no suicides in any of these boxers. In 1973, Corsellus and his colleagues studied 15 brains of retired boxers. They identified four neuropathological criteria, uh, abnormalities of the septum, scarring of the cerebellum, uh, degeneration of the substantia nigra, and widespread neurofibrillary tangles. Those were the original four neuropathological criteria. These brains were reanalyzed in 1990 by uh, Roberts, Alsop, and Bruton uh, using more improved histochemical techniques. And they found that what all these brains really had was beta amyloid also. And beta amyloid and tau are what you see in Alzheimer's disease, as Dr. Uh, Bale said. These brains, which I think are, have been autopsied more than any other in the world, underwent another analysis in England uh, in 2018 using that new criterion for what is CTE that was published in 2016. Half of these brains met the criteria for CTE. All of them were also positive for RTAG, which was that type of abnormal protein, uh, tau protein that Dr. Bales mentioned. So, The next thing that happened in the 20th century was Ira Kasson's study. He looked at 15 professional boxers using CT, EEG, and neuropsych testing. This is what really led to uh, reformation of boxing management, which was reformed before any other sport. And this was in the 1980s. Barry Jordan in 1997 showed that those who had the gene APOEE4 uh, were more likely to develop a CTE-like syndrome and showed that exposure plus genetic factors had to do with later life cognitive impairment. So across the 20th century, there were all these different descriptions of the syndrome. Uh, from my research, the, the earliest use of the term CTE was Bauman and Blau in 1940. So at the end of the 20th century, we sort of thought that CTE was a, a disease found in about 17% of boxers. It was stable with some age-related worsening. There were four neuropathological criteria, may have resulted from an interaction of exposure plus genetics, and may have been a form of Alzheimer's or was a comorbidity. That's where we were at the end of the 20th century. Now, what we are told we know about modern CTE. There have basically been two groups who have been at the forefront of CTE research. The first, Bennett Amalu, uh, mentioned by Dr. Bales, and then the Boston group, uh, Bob Stern, Ann McKee, Chris Nowinski, and, and Bob Cantu. Uh, Omalu has published four case studies and one case series and, and a movie. Uh, the Boston group has published several case studies and series related to CTE. 
these are the first four cases that were published in the literature that Dr. Bales has reviewed. I would add as a footnote on the Benoit uh, suicide, uh, there were high levels of testosterone, alprazolam or Xanax, and steroids also found in Benoit's uh, uh, autopsy, but those factors for some reason were deemed irrelevant. Um, but those are the four cases, and then uh, Amalu published one case series where 71% of the people had CTE. The Boston group has really taken the lead since then. Their first series was 51 confirmed cases, 46 of whom were athletes, and 39 were boxers. There, there are three core tenets which have remained constant over time. There's overwhelming evidence that the condition is a result of repeated sublethal brain trauma, that the, this disorder or disease is progressive, and CTE is characterized by an abnormal perivascular deposition of P-tau, hyperphosphorylated tau, at the depths of the cerebral cell psi. And those three tenants have remained constant over time. The second series was published in 2013, a total of 85 subjects, 80% uh, were found to be positive for CTE. And then the study in 2017, which was the most read study in JAMA that year of football players, uh, concluding that uh, CTE is related to, may be related to participation in football. And this was uh, the MES study, which I'll get back to. The Boston group has postulated subtypes of CTE. Bob Stern uh, and his group in 2013 said there are two types. One is a younger age onset with primarily mood symptoms, and the second type is older age onset with primarily cognitive symptoms. The problem I have with that distinction is that applies to every known neurodegenerative or neuropsychiatric disease known to medicine. Uh, the following year, they posited some research diagnostic criteria. Uh, the three core features, change in cognition, behavior, or mood. And you had to have one or more. The supportive features, impulsivity, anxiety, apathy, paranoid, suicidal, headaches, motor sign, decline, plus or minus uh, delayed onset. Now, these core features apply to all neuropsychological syndromes. And on a bad day, anybody 55 or older is probably going to have one or more of these symptoms. So I'm going to maintain that these symptoms are very sensitive, but they are not specific. And thank you for laying the groundwork on sensitive and specific, uh, Jeff. Now, I just this slide summarizes what the Boston Group's research has said over the years. If you start playing tackle football before age 12, you're more likely to have worse neurocognitive functioning later in life an earlier onset of neurobehavioral problems, a thinner corpus callosum, and smaller thalamic volumes. If you participate in contact sports at any age, you have an increased risk of Lewy body deposition, increased risk of TDP43 formation, and of course, deposition of P-tau. And if you play football or any other contact sport where repetitive head injury occurs, you have an increased risk for apathy, executive dysfunction, depression, and cognitive impairment. It can decrease your cognitive reserve. It can shrink your brain, both gray and white matter. Increase your risk for dementia and increase your risk for suicide, mood disorder, and personality change. Scary findings. Now, what do our colleagues tell us about CTE, the smart people? Because when we don't have facts, we get groups of smart people together, and they sort of lead the way. The concussion in sport group at its last two meetings came to the same conclusion. They recognized the existence of a CTE syndrome, that it's a distinct tauopathy, but there's no cause and effect relationship between participation in contact sports or concussions and CTE. 
Uh, the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine has had two position statements on concussion. Uh, this guy from NADA uh, led a paper in 2014, and the Sports Neuropsychology Societies published uh, position papers in 2015 and 18. All of these groups conclude we don't see a cause and effect relationship between concussions or contact sports and CTE. Mark Halstead, in the more recent uh, American Academy of Pediatric position, said we still don't see the evidence, we need more research. The same has come out of Australia, and the same was published this year from a soccer summit uh, held in New York a couple of years ago. So the bottom line is we have this dramatic disconnect between some published studies, what the public believes, and what scientific consensus tells us. Okay, so this leads me to ask some questions. So let's drill down a little bit into the CTE data and see if we can make sense out of the nonsense. First of all, the bad news. All of you have tau in your brain. Every one of you. And if you didn't have it, you'd probably be dead. Tau is the structural support that holds the neuron together. By age 30, everybody has a little bit of abnormal tau in their brain. And it tends to increase as we get older. Now, when tau breaks down, so does the microtubule. The neuron falls apart and dies and clumps together into this hyperphosphorylated tau. There are 20 different neurologic conditions associated with abnormal tau aggregation in the brain. There are six isoforms of tau, as Dr. Bales mentioned, and CTE is but one type. So you got tau. Now, I, I went to, uh, I met someone in the lunch line who was at this uh, conference at Big Sky a couple years ago. Uh, yeah. And I listened to Rudy Castellani, who's a neuropathologist, and Rudy asked some really good questions. Uh, he said, is CTE an artifact of uh, hypersensitive histochemical staining techniques? Well, I'm a neuropsychologist. I don't have a clue about that one, so I'll leave that to the neuropathologists. But he also asked, what are the neuropathological criteria for CTE? What are the interrater reliabilities for diagnosing tauopathies and CTE? Is PTAU alone diagnostic of CTE? And do you only find PTAU in people with a history of concussion? Very good questions. In 2016, a paper was published, uh, the TBI CTE group. They studied 25 cases that were prepared with virtual slides by the Boston group. 10 of these 25 cases were CTE stage three or four. The remaining were different types of tauopathies. What the consensus panel concluded, there was only one criterion to diagnose CTE, and that was the presence of P-tau at the depths of the sulcus. That was the only criterion. Mild CTE was or stage one was defined as one or two lesions. Stage two was three or more lesions. Stage three was, quote, multiple lesions, lesions. And stage four was densely distributed lesions. Now, when these neuropathological experts reviewed these 25 slides, they showed them the tauopathy slides first. And they said, is this a tauopathy or not? The degree of agreement was 67% which means that 33% of neuropathological experts at a tauopathy conference disagreed on whether this was a tauopathy. When they showed them the CTE cases and after they discussed the history, the agreement level was 78%, which means that 22% of an experts at a CTE diagnostic conference disagreed on a CTE diagnosis. <clears throat> 
Now, how does that compare to interrater reliability for Alzheimer's? You usually see 92 to 98 percent agreement. But when you read the article, and, and I'm a nerd, I, I read the article, I read the abstract, I read the references, I read the supplementary materials, which uh, is becoming a lost art. But in the article they say, when we evaluated the 10 cases with CTE, 91.4% agreed on a CTE diagnosis. And I'm going, how can that be? If the inter-rater reliability was only 78%, how do they come up with 91%? So I went and looked at the supplementary table. These were the 10 cases. There were seven neuropathologists. Two of them were from Boston University, and one was from the Mayo Clinic. And so I looked and said, how many diagnosed CTE only? Three of the seven raters diagnosed CTE five out of the seven times. But look at the rest of the neuropathological experts who are diagnosing CTE only. They weren't as certain that this was CTE. Now, you know, again, I'm not a neuropathologist. I used to think a neuropathological finding was precise, exact, scientific, and definitive. And apparently it's not. Uh, these people did not agree entirely. Next question, is PTAU only found in CTE? The answer, no. You find this in epilepsy, and I think this was one of Bazarian's studies. You find it in multiple system atrophy. You find it in uh, ALS. You find it in patients with schizophrenia who've undergone a leukotomy. And you find it in people who abuse opioids. Now, so what, you may ask? Let's go back to the MES study. When you look at those NFL players, two-thirds of the people with mild CTE and two-thirds of the people with severe CTE had a history of opiate abuse. Now, do retired NFL players abuse drugs? Well, yeah. And Linda Kotler from Miami has done some really good survey studies of retired NFL players. The most recent one showed that over 26% of retired NFL players are still using opiates. That's a lot. And opiate abuse is a cause of abnormal tau deposition. That's the important point. Do you only find CTE in people with a history of repetitive MTBI or concussion? No. Lily Naz Hazrati from Canada published a case showing uh, positive CTE-like findings in someone who had no history of head trauma, dementia, cognitive impairment, or participation in contact sports. In the most recent paper from the Boston group using tau pet to identify uh, levels of tau in the brains of, of living people. Looked at 26 former NFL players with neuropsychiatric symptoms and 30 controls. They found three brain areas of the NFL players that had higher tau levels. Now again, I'm a nerd, so I go and I, I look at the numbers, and when you look at these numbers between the groups, they overlap quite a bit. Second, these scans are not specific for the specific isoform of P-tau that the Boston group claims is responsible for CTE. And to me, what, what just shocked me is the control group had no history of concussion, but they did not screen them to determine if they had played contact sports. And their position now is it's not concussion that causes CTE, it's subconcussion or repetitive head injury, but that was not a screening matter for the control group. Also, there was no correlation whatsoever between tau levels and cognitive scores or neuropsychiatric symptoms. So I find this study very underwhelming. Now, I got three questions for you. Uh, you have to have at least one lesion at the depths of the sulci uh, 
to qualify for a diagnosis of CTE according to the current criterion. Now, would a neuropathologist identify one area of beta amyloid or one area of TDP43 or, or one area of anything and then diagnose a disease? I don't think that would happen. And recently, Willie Stewart, who's a neuropathologist, I think from Scotland, uh, actually came out and said, one little spot doesn't qualify for a diagnosis. What scares me is the Boston group is now telling us that CTE is like cancer. This is what Ann McKee has said and Chris Nowinski. And I think that is, is a very scary statement. Now, when you look at the cases of severe CTE, there are other neuropathologies found, beta amyloid, alpha-synuclein, TDP43, and these people also qualify for canonical degenerative diagnoses, such as Lewy body disease, frontotemporal dementia, progressive supranuclear palsy, et cetera, et cetera. My question is, can we simply ignore these other neuropathologies, and since we find one speck of CTE, say this is CTE, that's like going out in your backyard and finding 100,000 flies and 100,000 ants and 100,000 beetles and one wasp and saying, I got a wasp problem. That just doesn't make sense. Then they say that it's progressive. And it re they reference two prior studies, one showing deposition of multiple neurodegenerative proteins after exposure to TBI. Well, I looked up the reference, and the reference was to 18 patients who died after a single TBI. Now, I was impressed by a lot of the videos you guys showed. I mean, those are some pretty powerful G-forces, but none of those people died. And I don't see how you can say that a TBI that leads to death is the same as a subconcussive hit, and that if we see this at a subconcussive hit, it's the same as what we see in a fatal TBI. They also reference their own work about older patients with ApoE E4 status having a higher amyloid burden. Well, age is the greatest risk factor for having a higher amyloid burden. If you get older, just like abnormal tau, you're going to have abnormal, you're going to have amyloid in your head. So these, to me, are not convincing that it's a progressive disease. And uh, some colleagues and I have a paper in press now that should be out in the next couple, of, in the next month or so, questioning whether uh, this is a progressive disorder. So to try and summarize. Classical CTE was found in about 17% of boxers, had four neuropathological criteria, may have resulted from an interaction of exposure with genetics, may have been comorbid with and or a form of Alzheimer's, and has subsequently been found in only half of the Corcellus brains. We are told, however, that modern CTE is due to repetitive head trauma, occurs primarily in football players or other contact sport athletes, and in blast exposed military is progressive and is determined with certainty upon autopsy if we find any evidence of P-tau. I maintain that the single criterion and the proposed research diagnostic criteria for CTE may be sensitive but are hardly specific. The inter-rater re reliability of neuropathologists for CTE is suboptimal and we lack international consensus. We have written another paper showing how the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease has occurred over time through consensus groups, through refinements. Uh, we showed the evolution of the diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies and then contrasted that with what has happened in CTE and there's a world of difference. We have no appreciation for how PTAU interrelates with these other neuropathological lesions. And most importantly, there is no evidence to show that a P-tau lesion causes any of these cognitive mood or behavior changes. The outcome in life is multifactorial. Concussion and exposure to contact sports are not the only relevant variables in what happens in life 
And, and this study came out this year showing this very point. They looked at 35 NFL retirees who had at least one concussion. Uh, they looked at number of concussions, concussion with loss of consciousness, years played. What they found was none of those variables cor correlated with their cognitive scores. Life is much more multifactorial than simply concussions or playing contact sports. These are two recent uh, editorials that came out uh, from neuropathology groups, uh, basically saying that uh, there's no scientific evidence that playing contact sports increases your risk of dementia, uh, that CTE pathology is not only found in contact sport athletes. Uh, the diagnostic criterion uh, is, is preliminary at best. There's no evidence of CTE staging that's agreed upon. Uh, and as Dr. Bale said, uh, has resembled science by press conference. I challenge you to consider what is the burden of proof. In the eyes of the public and most of the media, it's a number of web hits and likes and tweets. In civil court, more likely than not, 51%. In criminal court, it's beyond a reasonable doubt, which I put at 95%. But in science, it's P less than 0.01 with independent replications and consensus required. Demand evidence. Think critically. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Broglio for inviting me, for all of you for having me. These are the folks at uh, the Vanderbilt Sports Concussion Center that I've had the pleasure of working with. I want to give a shout out to Tim Lee. Where are you? Tim Lee is the coordinator of our center in eight years. We are now up to 1,000 patients a year. We publish about 12 or 15 papers a year. And if any of you want to know how to run a sports concussion center, Talk to Tim, he's your man. Thank you for having me and 